So this will be the first Nika and this is a kind of projector <laughs> that I can imagine. So I will talk about introduction to machine learning and some application that that I have explained so far. Before I start, I just want to know that the uh, the background of our dear is there any programmer here? Programmer software engineer, can you raise up your hand? So is there does anyone have experience in in machine learning or data science interactive before? Can you please raise up your hand? Okay. So I think at, at least half of the audience do not have experience in the machine learning. Now that's great since yeah, this is kind of introduction for those who are expert, please stay with me. Okay, so this is a short introduction for me. My name is Ben Zhang and I have my Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and I have my Master in Science for Data Science and Analytics. And also I'm a PhD student in University of Science in Malaysia. Currently, I'm working in R&D manager in the One Up Wonders, which we are a health tech company. One of the focus on using technology to transform the healthcare. And lastly, I also started a, a project called Pharmacology, which is my teammate here, Fong and Fang Huai, which we want to use big data and Internet of Things to transform the agriculture in Malaysia, which I'll explain more later. Okay, so this is a table of content. So we will start with what is Few type of machine learning, the supervised and unsupervised, and then we will talk about some common practice and also some tools that you can use if you want to create your machine learning model or application. And lastly, we will talk about how to get started if you're interested, and also we will talk about some temporary project that, that hopefully can inspire you to start your first project in machine learning. Okay, so firstly, what is machine learning? By definition, the machine learning is application of AI that provides the ability to the application to learn without explicitly code. Means that the, the machine, the program, will learn from the data is not learned from the code itself. So yeah, how does that work and what is the difference between the machine learning and conditional AI? Do you know that even back to 1997, 20 years ago, you, we have a deep blue which is created by IBM and due that moment we don't have machine learning, we don't have deep learning but then this deep blue it even can defeat the world the, 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 the world chess champion so what's the difference between the traditional AI and machine learning? firstly the traditional AI is mostly based on the rules the rules are coded by human we sometimes code the rules and we define rules and then they use a book for search to search for the best solution this is how deep blue work for the for 20 years ago when at that time we didn't have the machine learning and recently yeah machine learning became hot topic more for reason also because of this this is AlphaGo this AlphaGo is created by created by the by Google which utilizes deep learning a subset of machine learning and then the difference between the deep blue and the AlphaGo is that this AlphaGo they don't have any hardcoded rules and or, or, or we can say that the programmer we won't code any any hardcoded rules or any predefined rules to make them to, to make the program work to make the program learn how to play the chess but instead we, we let the program play, play the chess themselves and then they can learn from experience they can learn from data so this is the definition of machine learning which means the machine learn from data, same as our human, we learn from experience. There are a few types of machine learning. And yeah, we have we have three types. We have supervised learning and supervised learning and reinforcement learning. And today we will focus more on the supervised and unsupervised learning and I'll briefly explain about this too. For reinforcement learning, we will not talk about that. For squares, so this is this is the definition for squares learning. For squares learning, it means that we supervise the machine from the labor data. What it means is, for example, we have a set of data set with the with the with the input data and output. For example, uh, we have an image. Uh, this is uh, with the label male or female for the human, and then we fetch all this data 
to the machine and and and, and with that machine, okay, this image is male and this is female, and machine will learn from the the data, the data, the input data, and then the machine will uh, the machine will recognize the feature of the input data, and then and then it will transform it. It will it will train it will train itself and create a learning algorithm. We have we have two types of, of the supervised learning here. The first one is the classification learning, which we predict a discrete value, for example, yes or no, male or female. And we also have a regression. Uh, the regression method which we predict a continuous value, for example, we want to predict the price, the weight, the height of the of the input data. Here, here we can see with the input data variable and output variable, we will create a learning algorithm which will learn from the input to map the output. Okay. And the second we have an unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning it means that there is no answer in the label data. It means even our human we also don't know what is the pattern in the data and we cannot tell the machine how to learn because, because, because we also don't know and then we will tell the algorithm please try to find the pattern in the data, in the input data and here we have the some raw data and we, yeah, we basically we don't know the difference and we, we put the algorithm and the algorithm will try to find the pattern and try to classify it and create few clustering and grouping and then it will it will come out the label and then tell you hey this is the and this is the uh, gray color and this is the orange color and so on. So for for super learning we have we have we have we have made uh, two main categories. The first one is the clustering. It means that to find the cluster or grouping of the input data. For example we want to group the people into different categories. Uh, or organize the large computer cluster. And second, we have a, we have a learning association. Means that we want to find the rules. For example, the web research mining or the market basket analysis. We want to find some hidden pattern inside the data. Okay, so yeah, that two are the different about the supervised and unsupervised. And we'll talk about some common practice that when, when we want to create a machine learning model. First of all, the the machine model, the machine learning model. We will, we will utilize up the we call the training data, and but we want to make sure that even we have a future hunting data, it, it also work everything for any. It, it not only work on the on the current data set, but also future data set. And usually, if we have an input data, for example, if we have 1,000 row, maybe we will split into maybe by 8, 2, or 7, 3, we sure, and then we will, we will recognize okay, the 70% as the training data and 30% as the test data. What, what we usually do is we will use 70% to train the algorithm and use the 30% to test the, to, to test the accuracy and the performance of the machine learning model. And this will ensure that we, 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 are not, we are not underfitting at the same time, we are also not overfitting. You, you can see that, that for, for underfitting, we will predict a lot of the equality labor. But in the overfitting, even though it's, it will maybe it will give you 100% accuracy for your current data set, but then it's too good to be true. Because that usually we won't we won't we won't reach the hundred percent or even we won't reach 95% of both kind of we want to ensure that it reach uh, it is good enough for current data and also for the for some future and see data. Okay. So here is some machine learning tools that I would recommend if you want to get started. For technical user you can come with Python and you can come with the app. And yeah, I strongly recommend you try to Python. Python is a is a general purpose language and not only used in the data science, also can use to build web, can also use to build desktop application and more. 
and recently if, if you are coming from programming background, you will say that Python has overtake Java and become the most popular language in the world. Java has been the most popular language in the world for I think for at least 10 years. And second, you also can try to R. If you are from a tech background, maybe you already know R and you can try that. For non-technical user, if you are if you don't know about coding, you can try about few tools and few tools available that that we out the technical knowledge involved for download the backup. It's free and it's quite powerful and contains a lot of algorithm for supervised or unsupervised and a lot more. And yeah, there's another tools, in rapid minder. This it comes with free version, but it also comes with a paid version. It's also powerful tools that allow you to do the data processing, data cleaning, and the machine and to build your machine learning model. If you are interested in machine learning or data science, if you if you if you are, if you want to start, here is few suggestions that I can give. First, you can subscribe to start online course, which I usually do. For example, I subscribe to few course at Coursera and Udemy. Yeah, you can get a, a lot of good courses there. And then you also can join some online community and competition. For example, Kegel. This is this is a this is a very good source for you to learn. And lastly, you also can participate in the in the hackathon. There's a lot of hackathon happen in Vietnam or in Malaysia. Where you can use your, your data science skill or machine learning skill to create some program. Okay. So here is some sample program that I hope can inspire you if you want to start your your maybe your first machine learning project. Yeah, this is one of the one of the competition that I participate with my team member. This is this this was the Intel Industrial Unity Challenge 2018. And me and my teammate were awarded as champion for this one. And our topic was about the smart environment monitoring system. Okay. So how this related to the machine learning? How we utilize our machine learning skill in this competition to create to create this application? For, for data science and machine learning, everything starts in the data acquisition. We need data to train our model. Without data, we, we can't do anything. So, for this, for this application, what we propose is we will use a dash cam plus some of the environment LD sensor and plus the Intel, Intel toolkit for the AI. And then we will plug into the, some public transport. For example, the, this is the rapid bus or the, or the police car, and then all this it will do the round, it will do the monitoring on the environment. For example, then maybe I should show this first. Okay. Yeah. For example, it will detect the certain defect. I think it's too small, but that there's a pothole there, which is which is detected by our machine learning algorithm. Yeah, this is another one. And then this is another example where, where we use our machine learning algorithm to detect the rubbish at, at the site. Here, here we utilize the image classification method to detect. Yeah. When we back to here, after, after we have the data, we, we did our object detection by using machine learning and deep learning, a subset of machine learning. And we apply some computer, some computer vision techniques and we do the data pre-processing and then, and then put our data into machine learning model and we select the good data set and then and finally we do the evaluation and then, and then we do the prediction. Yeah. Yeah, this is another project which which we we we, we created for a competition we call the Unimaker National Competition 2018. Actually this one currently we, we are still working on it. This is called we, we, we call some Lodi and we, we were a world champion for this. Okay. For this what we propose is we use the we use we use the IoT controller and sensor, IoT sensor for Internet of Things, which basically is a small device that connected to the internet. And then we this sensor 
will collect all the data for nutrient, for pH value, moisture, for temperature and for lightness and then all this data will be stored in the cloud and yeah, imagine with this cloud data we can do a lot of things for example, we can do anomaly detection and we will inform the when anything goes wrong and we, we, also, we also can create really a health status if we know that given this kind of image value and this kind of nutrient, the plant will go healthy so in future, we will suggest the farmer to stay with this to stay with this level of parameter. This is what we call that, that, that's, that is precision farming, which means we precisely control the environment and we precisely control the parameter in the farm. And also that it will deliver the, 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 the most healthy and most, most productive food for us. The second part is, we, we will do the plant disease detection by using the deep learning. And then here we can use under drone for this thing. for this video is taken by drone and we will use an image and video to detect whether the plant has disease or not. If yes, then then it will send an alert to the farm. Okay, I that's all I want to share. Yeah. Thank you and keep touch. This is my contact. Yeah, this is our website. And now should we get the session? Thank you. But stay there, stay there. <laughs> Do you expect to have more questions? <laughs> okay. Questions. Or maybe you don't. No questions at all? Nothing about the project? No? Really? Ah, it's first. I'm interested in the vision uh, techniques that you use. You know, it's difficult to process images. What? How do you? How did you do that? Just some interesting details about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for vision, usually it's, it's hard to process because due to due to few factors. First, for vision, the function is is big. And maybe you'll consume maybe up to few MP for a single file. And imagine you have a thousand or even you have more than hundred thousand of the images or even video. It's very hard to process. And yeah, this for this it is more few than here. The first is we will do the sampling. We will for example we will use a thousand sample the image, maybe from two thousand times two thousand into to maybe to just six hundred to times six hundred. Because we know that we know this so much details in the images and also involve the selection of the, the machine learning model we need to choose the parameter and we need to select the correct machine learning model for the, for the images So for example, your rubbish collection, like, will it only look for one object or does it do multiple? Yeah, thank you, guys. This is a good question here. Mm. Okay, so usually for, for one second, we have 30 feet. I mean, 30 or 60 feet for a typical video. And here we will, we, we will shorten to, if not mistaken, I think around 10, 10 feet per, per second. And then we, we won't do the detection for everything. We will do two things. The first is we will do the detection. And once we know, the second one is we will do the tracing. Which means we want to trace where the object is. So which means we don't need to repeatedly do our detection here. So we do our detection once and then we can repeatedly to trace the object. Because for tracing it's, it's much faster and 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 better than for for if you if you want to do the detection for for every single thing. Is 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 very it comes with a lot of power here. Okay, I have a following question on the on the stuff I give you enough time, Judge. Okay. Um, so so on on the example that you gave, right? There was rubbish, rubbish and uh, potholes, right? Okay. So that means that you train your learning model 
for detecting specific objects? What data set did you use for rubbish and for uh, potholes and how did you get that? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Sometimes the most difficult part is how we get the data. Mm, for this one, for the competition purpose, we get our data from few sources. The first is we drive our car and we install the dashboard, uh, the dash cam, and then we capture the images, the videos, and then we trade it. And second, we, we extract the image from the YouTube, from the Google, then we create some, then we create some tools to do the extraction. And, and go into MV4 for us to put the training. And, and, also, the, and also the manual labeling. So if I got it correctly, the training dataset is kind of manual, right? From your part? Uh, yes, because this is a manual in terms of we want to label the data and we have to let the machine know because this is a supervised learning and we have to let the machine know, hey, this video contains pop or hey, this contains rubbish and then so on. And so did you, so that there are uh, video recognition algorithms are now like quite widespread, uh, including already like pre-trained models for recognition, object recognition, right? Uh, could you have used like on the shelf model already instead of training your own model for revision potholes? Yeah, for this it need to be built on some kind of the pre-trained model. For example, YOLO version three is kind of convolutional neural network. But for our case, we, we didn't manage to get any similar pre-trained model that that we wanted. For example, if you want to do maybe facial or human detection, that's more common, and we can find a lot of pre-trained model. If we can model that we don't need to put so much of training data and we can we can just use the existing model. But for the for our case, you want to detect some specific, for example, pothole, rubbish, or some falling trees here. And that one we need to we yeah, we built on top of some training data, some some pre previous model, but still we need to train ourselves. And one more question. Ah. Uh, accuracy for this view, the competition accuracy was around 80 to 90 percent. 80 to 90 percent, yeah. But that one, it is not, it is not practical yet because yeah, we, we, we know that is just for competition purpose and we don't have enough data. It's kind of poor concept, but we know as long as we have the huge data, we can achieve the same thing. More questions? Ready? Come on. Ah. So for the training data set, do you guys have the your own custom neural network? Mm, we 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 try with few model. We for example we try with Inception version three. If you know that is this one one of the neural network model, we try with YOLO, and also we try with some our own our own custom model that we that we do from scratch. We created our layer. Layer means that this uh, to in in the deep learning you should have multiple layer, and each layer will contain certain function that is that is trained from data. And eventually, we found that we it's, it's better to use some preview model instead of you train from scratch and you build everything. I mean, you build your own custom layer, called custom model. GPU for, for training during, during that moment I use my I use my own 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 DC which is GTS ten sixteen. Storage. Storage? Sorry? Yeah for detection. But then that one is for training. For for the for the running for the detection we run on the the Intel Yeah, for the we run on the Intel upkeeps. Upkeeps is, is like similar with Raspberry Pi and we run with, we run with the Intel more, more with the GPU. Yeah, because this is the Intel competition, they want us to use their, their tools. And yeah, we, we do our presentation and demo for the competition with using the, the, the Intel toolkits, basically. And also the Intel platform. So for like the detection, it's not actually 
you know, for the detection, it can be, we can use GPU, but for that competition, we use the, this is we call the VPU, the video processing unit, which is developed by the Intel. Sorry, sorry. One more. One more. Yeah. Okay. Could you like tell a little bit about uh, like the non-technical for the non-technical users? So it seems to be like uh, on the shelf solutions. Uh, what do they provide exactly? Thank you. Okay. For non-technical, so for the black car, it means for non-technical because you know you to do the coding here. For example, black car, it provides a nice graphic user interface for you, and you just need to. model you want but you don't need to put, put that yourself you just need to select the appropriate model and then you just need to click the button to run it it's like i can say it's like uh, tools for the itself which is already built by the expert and does not involve any any competitive coding and this is a good tools if you want to start without any programming experience or knowledge uh, the data yes yes some limitation so far, I tried that it supports it supports uh, CSV itself, and I, I'm not sure about if. Oh, it. Like, uh, okay. Or my car usually we will we will use the we call the structured data means that we need to have a row. We need to have each data need to have a row and, and column. For each, it's not images that we call that unstructured data because we don't have the we don't have a row and column there. And for the data, usually we need to have a data like what you have seen in the in the table. For example, table in Excel, we we should can import into the file. Can you go to the next uh, slide? So, since you said, like most of you said that you don't have any. Uh, no. Uh, ah, no, 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 that's correct. That's correct. correct sorry. Uh, since most of you said that you don't have any background in machine learning, uh, the online courses, do you have any recommendation among the billions of courses that there are on the internet now? Uh, yes, I, I do have. I, I, I subscribe to few, if for not that nigga, uh, I subscribe to few would be courses. Which I think is called A2, A2Z machine learning, A2Z big learning, and A2Z data science. That one is quite straightforward. It's quite straightforward and teach you how to. It won't tell a lot of a lot of theory. It just tell you how to achieve a result. And yeah, this usually the start for the older me. You just want to know how to do it, and but you don't you don't want to understand what is the theory behind because that's very complicated. And for Coursera. If you are interested to know the theory behind for Coursera, I would recommend you a very famous course, Introduction to Machine Learning by Andrew Ng. Andrew is a, he, he was a professor in Harvard, and that, for that for that course, it explain it's very it's very detailed, even teach you how to build the machine learning model from scratch, and that one involves a lot of coding, involves a lot of statistics, involves a lot of, a lot of mathematics. There is a free online book, by the way, from Andrew M. Still no question? Oh my god, it's like a, like a dialogue between us. Okay, uh, can you go back to the smart environment one? The, with the, no, no, the, the your, your first uh, example. Next, next. Yeah, so, and next, again. Okay, so, you the example you gave was like image recognition, right? Okay, so you detected potholes. Then what? What what's what's your purpose? Do you collect the like uh, like GPS coordinates and send that to I don't know 
like uh, the Malaysian authorities for filling potholes? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, for this one, I, I, I didn't mention clearly here. And usually we will detect the images. Once we detect something, we will, we will set the GPS location along with the pictures and images to the cloud. And here we can see we also have some LP sensors and it involves the GPS also. So once the once the uh, GPS and the video are sent to the authority, for example the NTPC in Penang, and then yeah, they will they will they will need to take action and they will need to schedule their their staff to go there and and, and, and do the clean up. Uh, no, for this one, for this one, have, uh, after we have a competition, we, we haven't gone into deeper. It's not like the second one, we, we are still looking for it. Uh, uh, my best client tonight. Yeah. He's not really like CSI, but like, uh, at some point he said he was speaking CSI and stuff. It's not really, no, we... No, okay, for that one, we do the education. We do the gate detection at the at the IoT devices, which means we, we won't we won't process every single frame to the cloud. But instead we 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 do the processing at the edge detection, which is coming inside the, the Intel model this video is is a powerful stick that can allow us to do that. Means that we, sorry? That we build stick that we stick is plugged into the is plugged to IoT devices. And then yeah, we, we do the detection at, at the edge at the edge devices and once we detect something, some maybe the pothole we only send to the authority to the cloud. We won't yeah, we won't send every single thing. That's the advantage if we if we use this kind of the IoT devices. We have a few more minutes, that's your last chance. Ah, is it for me to try now that you are so far away? Hi, uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, I want to know what's the accuracy of the object detection that you have? Do you, do you mean for both projects or, or just for the other one? Uh, usually we will achieve for we will achieve around at least eighty percent. We we call that machine mark. We will achieve at least, at least thirty percent, and then we are trying to improve that. For the for the both the highest one, if not mistaken, we will achieve around if around ninety. By 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 by, I cannot recall the way the way the way achieve higher than ninety. For for a machine learning model to be usable. For especially for the image classification, usually we will we will try to achieve at least seventy percent above, so that it's only considered as a as a usable and a current model. I think even seventy percent is not not really accurate for me. No, I mean accuracy in general, not the precision or recall. Yeah. Okay, I have a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that you need to be prepared. I have always a lot of questions. Uh, can you go to the farming project? Okay. Uh, so. For the usages, right? Uh, so the, the beginning dashboard and so on are not so much. They are more like data visualization than than machine learning, right? If I'm correct, you are like providing to the user uh, like the values of all these attributes, like nutrients, pH value, moisture, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for that one, yeah, I I didn't mention it here because at the, at the beginning we. We didn't realize this this feature because at the starting we just want to collect the collect the data and want to show the data to the user through the dashboard, and then we want to provide some kind of an alert or, or we, and we want to do some automation here. But as 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 soon as we collect the the enough number of data, we realize that we can do something more than that. 
from the data that we have. For example, we have we have the moisture here, we have temperature, and we we can know what combination other can create a perfect environment for the farmer for the plant to to grow. Perfect introduction for my next question. Okay, when you say that uh, you create the perfect environment, right? That means that you know what the perfect environment is. So meaning that you collect the data, and if the data are out of these ranges, then you say, okay, that's not that's not perfect. But how do you know about the perfect environment? Yeah, you. This involve for the for data science. Usually, we involve a lot of the domain knowledge also. This one we we have done some collaboration with the farmer. I'm not sure it's in your book here. And is that we we also did some collaboration. No, we we are still doing some collaboration with one of the startup in Vietnam, which we call Igabun, and we and we we set up our IoT devices and sensors and also video and, and also camera at their farm. And what we are doing is we collect the data from from the sensors and also from the camera. And then yeah, this we need the input from the farmer to tell us whether this is concept is healthy or not. And then yeah, here here we need to do some manual Manual labeling, and then so that we can tell our machine this is healthy, this is unhealthy, and this is yes, this is this is not perfect, and this is perfect this is kind of thing, and then yeah, and then then and then in future we can we can do the prediction based on the parameters. Um, hello, um, I would like to ask about. How do you maintain a positive, a positive cash flow about your company, like um, your revenue stream with this? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for that one, we just started, and and for now, we we don't really have the we don't really have a stable revenue stream yet. And what we are using is using a fund for the use a fund for our competition, and so we. Yeah, we some we using our own, our own money to to be our start, and then what we hope is at least at least we at least we can sustain for the first or second years, and then and then for the third year we we will start to 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 think how to generate income. For now, mostly it's for us to collect the data and do and and train our model and also. And and also build a different version of our of our IoT device and and make it to become better. I'm sorry, that will be the last question. I'm interested, more more interested to the smart environment one because just now you show a footage whereby the device is in, is placed on the car and then moving right. Because I see this kind of the car speed is kind of slow. How if the car is moving quite fast? You do have a certain limit for it to uh, allow it capture. For the for the car speed, we we actually we haven't really test on the fast speed. For uh, for this video, I I can I can imagine the speed is quite fast for me at least. I'm not sure it's more than sixty sixty km per hour. I I don't know, but. But the speed, but but the speed of a car will create means that it will, it will. Let me think about. Technically, it's still the same because technically the frame is still the same. You we still have ten 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 per second, but just the object is moving fast. And for us, we train on we train based on the frame. For example, we won't train based on the video. So so as long as you you move fast, but you have a frame that that contain the object, then we can train. Still adapted to pinning driving style. That's what you say. Okay. Okay. Uh, that will be the last question for our speaker now. Uh, we have Fum, okay, who knows also about uh, all these subjects. So after the second talk, if you want to ask more questions and have a talk with Fum, you can also do it. Okay. Thanks a lot for all your questions, by the way. Can we thank the speaker again? Okay. So our Second talk is by Ethan. So Ethan is my colleague in PicoChart. Uh, he's working as a data analyst. Oh,
He's working as a data analyst in Olympian. He studied uh, political science and information technology, focusing on business analytics during university. Previously, he was working in the US, in Senegal, in Tanzania, helping small social enterprises increase their impact and reach among the urban and rural poor through data analysis and tools. He's passionate about data analytics and he loves to learn new tools and concepts. All right. Please give a round of applause for Ethan. Hello. Um, so, today I'm going to talk about sentiment and social media analytics. And I will, this is basically what got me really interested into data analysis because, as I'll talk later on in the presentation, my thesis in undergraduate was using sentiment analysis and social media analytics to combine my two degrees, which was political science and business analytics. So, we all use phones, and many of us have social media apps on those phones. Some of us might not use them for like data purposes, but many of us do. And this is providing a lot and lot of information that people can access, and particularly companies and uh, a lot of other people who want to understand what people are doing and what they're portraying. And whenever we post something on, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, we kind of have a purpose behind that, and that's the idea of what this sentiment is. It's the emotion or content that we're, per, we're showing, and it can either portray a more negative, or a positive, or kind of somewhere in between in a neutral sense. And so what we are trying to understand with the sentiment analysis, which is kind of a subcategory, and I'll get into that, is understanding what the user is portraying and how we can better interact with them. So, in today's talk, I will first introduce and say a little bit more about myself, then we'll talk about what social media anal analysis is, sentiment analysis, and then why we would want to analyze social media, and some tools and tips, and then a couple of examples, and then I will conclude. So, this is me. Um, I'm Ethan, as Flavian said. I work at CryptoChart now, um, but I've only been here for about four months. And though I'm talking about sentiment and social media analytics, not my expertise. Uh, so definitely, this will be a more introductory talk. And I think that if you're interested, I'm giving a lot of tools um, later on in the presentation and resources that you can access. And if you want to learn more, then uh, Flavian will share this link with you. Um, but as Flavian mentioned, I studied political science and business analytics. And I really was interested in the combination of how you can understand the way people are voting in certain elections or the way that people are interacting in certain political spheres. And so the way that I really wanted to do that is I needed a more technical background, and so that's why I added the business analytics side. I started out as just poli sci. Um, but I worked in Tanzania and in Chicago doing more social enterprise work. So I worked with rural farmers in Tanzania, and I used data analysis there to understand how we can improve the farming culture for people who are living on less than $1 a day, and so that they can get more crops and yield, and so that they can end up making more money and improve their lifestyle. And in Chicago, I worked with homeless youth on the streets, and we did a lot of surveys and data collection to understand who we're serving and how we can better serve people who are the most marginalized and don't have anything. And most of the languages I use are SQL, Python, and VBA, which is in Excel, which is where I first started coding, and it's a really backwards language, but um, you have to start somewhere. Um, so, getting more into what the topic is actually about, what is social media analytics? So, basically, social media analytics is gathering the data that is provided from all of the millions of users who are accessing the different social media apps. And those social media is a very loose term. Like I put just three because they're quite wide known, like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, but there are so many that people are using and are producing data. And a lot of them, you can access this data for free. Um, and you can only look at the people you might be connected with, but some, if they're producing public information, then you'll be able to access that as well. 
Um, and it lies at the intersection of social science and computer science. So yes, you have to kind of have this more technical understanding to be able to write the code and understand how you can analyze, but you're trying to understand this more social problem and figure out a way that you can better improve based on the problem. So there are a, like this is one of the models that you can use when trying to go through social media and analyze. And so uh, I'll briefly just go over. But the first, um, you want to define the problem. So you want to have a question in mind of what you're going to try to understand. You can't just analyze the social aspect or all of the information because you'll be overwhelmed and you might not understand what you're trying to do. But you have to go in with a particular purpose and say, oh, I want to understand how these people are interacting or what these people are saying with my company on this particular platform. And then you figure out where you're going to get that data, so which is the social media app that you're going to use. And then you go on and uh, further into the more technical and start to do the analysis, getting capturing the data, pulling it into one data set, and then with the data set, you move forward and figure out the different keywords that you're going to see. And you run through analysis, and once you get results, then you see, okay, does this answer the question that I'm doing, or was my hypothesis wrong? And then if it was wrong, you go back and you redo, and it's a cyclical problem. And so if you done a lot of, like if you took science classes, it's very similar. You have a hypothesis, you have this question, you go through, you test it, and if it doesn't work, you keep testing and figuring out what the answer is. But we need tools to help, and this is where sentiment analysis can come in. Um, the tools help us to mimic the way that the brain works, so we have to see when we are posting something on an app, like I mentioned, we're putting an emotion into that, and that's coming from our brain or from our heart, and we have to have a tool that can help us to interpret, because just reading a word doesn't necessarily connote a certain meaning, but we can have ways that we can try to mimic the way that humans are writing this content. And so this brings us into sentiment analysis. So what is sentiment analysis? It's one of the most common natural language processing tools, and it focuses on taking the text and combining that with the different ways that you can code into the text to understand. So you provide ways, like these are the certain words that will be a more positive meaning, and these are the words that are more negative based on the most common words that you might get from the data set. And it determines the tone behind that word because you are imagining it before and determining how it's going to say so that we can better understand the opinions that are expressed. And so this kind of graphic shows a little bit more in detail. So for example, if a customer service um, person is working, they might get a positive or a negative reaction uh, based on the app. So, Say you're like Grab and you're working with people who are posting on an app on some social media, say talking about Grab, and they put timely, nice, helpful, that might connote a more positive emotion. While if they say didn't fix the issue or the customer service person was rude, then this would be more negative. And then you can kind of gauge where you lie in the way that people are understanding and working with you. And if you're in the more negative, you might want to figure a way to get to the more positive. And so another example is um, with Uber, so similar to Grab. Um, there was a study that uh, Uber conducted where they looked at 21,000 tweets and they looked at whether they were going to be in the more negative or positive. And we can see the they created this uh, website that we can look at the way that they use to analyze and see how it ends up. Um, okay, so this was the first one. It's kind of hard to read, but it says, I still haven't heard from you about you changing me a can charging me a cancellation fee for the driver canceling my ride. And so if you click analyze, then you can see that it shows a 94.8% chance that it's negative based on the words that are used. And in the second, we see flat rate was the best thing that happened this year. And when it analyzes, it says that it's a 94.7% chance 
of being positive. So they're using the sentiment analysis to understand the way that their Uber support is interacting with customers. And so then we can also look into a graph that they made based on that and subdivide it into different topics. So cancellations, payments, price, safety, and service, and the words that they um, use within the different tweets. And we can see that it's divided. And so if we look at payment, it might show that it's a fairly even look. People didn't really think that it was positive or negative because it's 40 to 42% they are pretty similar and also in safety, but we can see that people weren't necessarily happy about the price because it's a much higher percentage of people who are in a negative connotation, connotation sorry, than in the positive. And then if we even filter it down more into the data set and the research that they did, and taking out spam with the tweets, so people just like saying Uber support and not really meaning anything, or putting marketing like, ooh, Uber support, you should sponsor my business, and getting rid of all of the irrelevant topics, then we can see an even more drastic difference, and that there are more unhappy people interacting with Uber support than there are happy people. And this is something that, this was done in 2017, and so Uber really worked to try to improve their customer service. And though it's not perfect, this was kind of the baseline to understand where they are. And so, this kind of leads to why do we want to analyze or look into social media? And so social media has given consumers a virtual stage to really just like share what they think, whether that's good or bad. Um, and we can see that not all of these are going to be about particular products necessarily, but there are over 6,000 tweets produced every second around the world, 500,000 comments posted on Facebook every minute and 400 hours of YouTube video uploaded every minute. So there's tons and tons of information and data that's being put into many different mediums of social media. And so what can we do with all of this information? And we can try to understand and really once we target and have that question in mind of what we want, we can do a lot of these different ways to understand. So one can be audience segmentation. We can try to see who is our consumer? Like, what are they interested in based on the things that they're liking on certain social media, the things that they're posting, the words that they're saying? Um, we can improve our customer service and experience as we've seen in the Uber example. Uh, we can figure out information discovery, so similar to the first of audience segmentation, like what is our consumer's interest and what is the information that they're producing and showcasing and how can we capture that and move forward. Uh, we can facilitate positive communication. So if we know what our consumers and users are really interested in, then we can kind of use that to say, oh, you might be interested in this, um, and I've seen that you like these things, so that's kind of like an Amazon approach. Like, this is something that you like, so let's move forward and recommend something else and build that relationship over time and more things that they're interested in. And then we can summarize sentiments and understand behavior. So the way that they're interacting online kind of matches the way that they might be interacting offline. And so this is the part where I'll show some of the resources that I found to be quite helpful when I was starting this. Um, there, and some of these weren't around also when I first began, but there is one on uh, Skillshare, and they have 24 different videos, so if you sign up, it's about social media and analytics, and it's particularly with Python, which is the language I use, but there are probably other resources as well if you're interested in doing a different type of language, but Python is quite robust with the different tools that they offer, and once you start to use this, then Python you can use a lot uh, for different things, and in the first presentation you can see that you can use it for machine learning as well. So it's not just limited to one particular thing. There's also a course on DataCamp that is also with Python, but analyzing social media, so it can really provide this introductory step. So if you have no experience, this is somewhere that you can start and try to understand. Um, and there are also YouTube videos um, that you can use, which 
So this is an API, which is, if you don't know an API, it's a way that we can connect different softwares together and interface with each other so that it makes it easier with the communication between the two. And you don't have to code everything again because it's already stored in that source code. And then you can use it and it makes it much easier to access. And so with this one, they, um, it's produced by Lucid Programming, and it's quite extensive with the amount of information that he goes through. And he shows how to download it directly from the API and connect it to your Python, and then also like how you can analyze different things within it. And so it shows the full comprehensive um, background. And so starting from the introductory point is not a problem. You can really get to go from there as well. Um, and then there's some other websites as well with Python Central that they show introductory to Tweepy, Twitter for Python, um, and then even the developer side of Twitter shows the way that you can connect to Twitter as well and the ways that um, they're entities. And so these parts right here, so hashtags, URLs, user mentions, symbols, these are the ways that you can filter down and dive more into. So if you have a particular hashtag that you're looking for within Twitter, then you would use ha the hashtag entity to then dive further in. Or if you're looking for a particular symbol, which is like emojis, then you can also look into that and see the way that the users are writing their tweets. And so another example, this is, um, basically what my thesis was on and what kind of got me interested in it in the first place. So in the, uh, like early, the late 2000s and early 2010s in the United States, we had a lot of like political movements going around that used social media and especially the use of hashtags of, among all of those different social medias. And so we can see that uh, this is a research center that's in the U.S. Um, that used Twitter and different social media to analyze the way that people are writing about these particular political movements. So one example particular with the Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, or All Lives Matter, there's June 17 to 27, 2017, so like 22% of the tweets around this particular event and history were talking about fatal police encounters. Or the march, which was just last year, uh, in 2018, 25% were talking about violent acts. So we can see that um, the way that people are talking about these different political movements also might mean something more in general. And though this came after I did my thesis, Mine was more talking and trying to understand the way that people who are engaging and interacting on Twitter and how they're sharing their posts, does this kind of correspond and correlate to the way that they're acting outside of online? Or are they a totally different persona online and offline you would never know that they're the ones producing this? And so my hypothesis was to try to understand this and what I figured out is that people who are politically online, driven online, they can lead to violence if they are in the minority. So if they are supporting this political movement and they think that it's good and they're in the mi minority, it's going to more likely lead to violence than if they were in the majority. And that is because the way that they're interacting with people, they're feeling confronted online and it really enrages them, and you can see the progression of the way that their tweets are going as well. Um, and I didn't show a lot of this because it's really in-depth and complicated, and I didn't think I had time. But the way that you can see the progression and their emotions like becoming more and more to one side, then the people outside and that are disagreeing with them are also going to become more opposed, and then they're just flashing, and then offline, people are like, okay, I give up, I don't wanna deal with this anymore, and that leads to more violent reaction. And so this is what really got me interested in social media analytics, um, because it really can have a deeper meaning than just trying to understand or like 
just posting something, oh, look at me, I'm at this concert. Um, there are a lot of ways that social media can be productive, and the way that we can engage with it as well if we're doing analysis is quite robust. So some learnings that I took from doing this, um, because I think that might be more interesting or important than just going through the complicated part for people who might not understand the technical nature. Um, APIs are powerful but can be limited. So the way that they're built by nature, they're going to be limited because they're not going to be able to give you access to every single thing. Um, but a lot of times, um, you can also rewrite or kind of integrate other parts into the API and make it an even more robust or more comprehensive tool to be used. Um, you can't assume accuracy. So some of the show, uh, examples that I showed as well, like such as the one where we were looking at the sentiment that Uber was using, you can't always assume that it's accurate because someone might have a sarcastic response and they're like, wow, this was such a great time and they might not be a positive reaction, but they're actually like, wow, that was horrible. Thank you for wasting my time. Um, and so they are working into integrating more, um, trying to understand the sarcasm as well. Um, but you can't just go off like, oh, this is the tool that's already available. So yes, it's 100% real and I'm not going to question it. You always, within data analytics field especially, you have to question um, and you have to be aware that it's not going to necessarily be and it will never be 100% accurate. Um, so also analysis is a form of hypothesizing. So as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, it's kind of like a science model. You're going through, you're testing, and you have this idea, and then you're going to see, OK, this is the reality, and this is not exactly what I thought it would be. Um, again, sentiments aren't capital truth, but help us to understand. So when we understand the sentiments of our users, that doesn't mean 100% oh yes they are really happy with us but we just have to understand okay they might be okay with us now but we have to make sure that we're going to continue to do well and move forward and not just oh we're, everyone's happy with us okay we're doing fine and then like people are going to maybe get unhappy over time because you might become complacent and manual checks are necessary so with using different tools you have to also just see the different tests that you're using. Okay, so I plug in this, like when I read it, I can see, oh yes, this person is probably quite unhappy. Does the model also show that it's unhappy? Okay, let's move forward. Um, and you have to do those um, at different times just to make sure that you're on the right track and that the model is working. So, in conclusion, we have lots of information that is available and we have a lot of opportunity to really engage with this information and try to understand the people who may be working with us in a, like a more business oriented way or they may be working with us as like in a political manner. So we are constituents to politicians. Are they listening to what we're saying? Or if we are a politician, are, they, are we listening to what people are saying online? And because people are using this, and a lot of times people don't have the opportunity to have face-to-face -face interactions, this is a way that we can try to understand the behavior and the understandings of our users and customers in a really fast way and to combine many, many users potentially into one time instead of having to do like one-on-one -on -one interviews with all of those people. So I will conclude with that and we'll welcome any questions. Questions? Hi, thank you Ethan for sharing. So just now uh, you did mention about this API, right? They are limited as well. So I suppose uh, Currently, Facebook do not have any API that allows us to access, right? Is that correct? And uh, since they, we don't have a way, I mean, we don't have the API to access uh, the data, then, is there currently an alternative to access 
Facebook data. Thank you. Yeah, so there's not officially a Facebook API, but there are unofficial ones um, that you can use, but they're not the most reliable. Um, but the, the way that I used it, at least when I was doing it for my thesis, um, I don't really look at Facebook much anymore, but the, you can look at a lot of the public posts because they're, that's really the only information that you have access to other than the people that are in your personal network, um, which would then be a bias because they're the ones that are close to you. But if you're looking at public, that's kind of the only way. Um, but there are, what I particularly use is there are a lot of research organizations that are accessing this information and then they aggregate it in a compiled manner so that then you can kind of look at the aggregate data. So you don't get to necessarily see the more personalized usage as you might get in the Twitter API, but you can get an uh, understanding in like, this is how everyone combined together using Facebook is thinking um, and they do have research like that. So that's definitely one of the limitations that can um, come about, but they are working. So the one that I showed you with the Uber as well, they operate, and I think in 70 languages now. Um, so the complicated might, part might be when you're saying yes, like speaking three languages within one sentence, that could be. But this is what I was saying, um, a way that you can integrate the APIs to try to train it yourself with a new model based on the way that your language processing works. And this is definitely a more advanced technical than like your introductory level, but it is something that is possible. Um, and there are lots of people that are doing this as well. Like the way, like if you ever use the chatbot, this is kind of the same idea that's going into the chatbot. Um, and a lot of them can interact and use the way that language is based on the way people are doing it where they are. Sorry if I can add on this one. Uh, during the <laughs> during the data conference by ICAT, uh, there was this guy who funded uh, Bus Uncle in Singapore. Does it, does it ring a bell? So it's kind of a chatbot for asking about some information about the buses in Singapore. And he literally trained the model for speaking English. So, so I know that Malaysian English is not English. No offense. Huh? <laughs> uh, uh, but it is possible. The, the question is then once you got that, how do you link it to this to the sentiment? Uh, that's another question. Any mm -hmm. other question? That's me, yeah. Yeah, don't mention that on Hi, uh, another question would be what would be the social media platforms that currently offer the API for us to access their data? I guess one of it will be Twitter, but other than that? So it's definitely mainly Twitter if you want like a full comprehensive API. Um, but because most of the social media are now owned by Facebook, um, they have kind of this uh, control over the way that people can interact and access their information. And that only became about since they started monopolizing the way that they own different social media. But the, I mean, you can always create your own <laughs> types. Like APIs is just the way that you can already interact, but you can find a way to write if you're really advanced and skilled in um, your Python skills or whatever language you're using. It just complicated. And you would like loop through the different pages that are scrolling that are public feeds and scrape the data and then you can mine it that way, but it's definitely a more time consuming and would take a lot more storage and like resources, but um, that is like one alternative that you can use. It's just the way that ownership rights and companies have, it complicates the issue, but 
Yeah. I don't know, like, there might be social media platforms here that I'm not aware of that are, like, very Asian-specific um, that might also have the opportunity, but... There is another concern, in fact, it's because of the rates of GDPR. You have heard about that? So GDPR is a set of rules for protecting uh, data privacy in Europe. So now the rules are much, much stricter in extracting data from APIs, even if you go to Twitter. Uh, if you want to, to use the API for uh, scrapping uh, public tweets, you have to fill up a form explaining the, like, the purpose of your, uh, of your uh, tool and things like that. Now, depending on what you are doing, okay, for businesses, maybe it's not, uh, it's not like, so available, but uh, Twitter, at least a couple of years ago, was running things like uh, they were opening their the data for research, for example. So in social sciences, you could set up a proposal uh, explaining what you wanted to, uh, to research on, and if it was fitting, then they were opening Twitter firewalls, which has in fact no limitation in terms of API, uh, where you can mine in fact, the tweets in a much deeper way. But it was specifically for uh, like research purposes. I don't think that it was for business ones. So there are there are in fact like uh, possibilities, despite the fact that uh, the APIs are private or things like that. Ah. Uh, something that you can 
also try to, you can kind of find out like if it's a spam or something that's going against, um, especially if there's, like you can see like the time that people are posting and what they're saying in reaction to different things. Um, and second, uh, I think that we can get a, a proxy because I would say in everything in life and no difference within social media, there are the people who behave abnormally or against what kind of everyone else is going to be doing. And so when they are behaving abnormally, that's not going to disrupt, but it just adds another element that we have to consider. And the social media is where you can also target. So kind of what I mentioned earlier, if you're looking at a specific group of the people who are interacting with your product or your service, then it's going to be a little bit less likely to get these wild um, ideas because if they're interacting with your platform and you're just having these um, engagements and customer service and you want to like look at the text without having to read through each individual one, but you want to like aggregate and try to get the sentiment, then that's going to be a more accurate proxy. Um, but if you're looking at everything in total, then it can definitely be a more complicated issue. I just wanted to ask, um, how do you know someone has reacted violently? How do you measure it? Yeah. So based on the the protests in the U.S. at least, um, so we look. This was not like measured within the social media platform. You measure the sentiment of like what they're showing online, and then you compare with what the aftermath was. So you can also like based on with Twitter at least, um, they do have the location, so you can see like where they're located when they're tweeting, and then you can reference down into that specific point, and then you see, oh, there was this protest where they blew up cars, they threw rocks at windows, people died, um, and then you can see that this was leading to more violence. And so you're not necessarily targeting like one particular person became violent, but you're seeing that in this general area, the sentiment was like this, and violence then occurred following that. Does that answer? I'm curious about like, the correlation. Um, like, how did you measure that correlation? Measure the correlation? So it's definitely like you're measuring the correlation by seeing like the amount of people that are active and versus the number of people who are involved in or living in this particular area. And it's not necessarily like saying because this happened, this happened, but it's just showing that this was happening and then this did happen. So there is some kind of way that the way people are acting online is going to maybe affect the way that they're reacting offline as well. Like if I did, I'm trying to imagine some model that you might use. I think that was So, yeah, so this one is not necessarily like a like a training model, I suppose. It was this was more in a social science way. So as I mentioned, I was doing social science, so my thesis was in that. And so the models in social science are quite different from the way that you use in technical or like scientific purposes. And so you're looking at relationships and it's not necessarily that you're going to have this model that's like because this happened, this happens, and then this happens, and like all the different causations that work. You just are measuring different things that are happening at the same time, and then something that might follow, and this is a commonality or common thread between them, and it's not the only one, but it is one of the potential ones. Other questions? We have a few minutes more. Uh, since currently you're working in Photoshop, right? Can you briefly explain what's your role there? 
um, I mean, how can you can you relate it to the business of uh, what Tik Tok is doing? Be careful with your answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I Bobby is actually my boss, um, <laughs> and so I do data analysis, as I said, but we are looking at who our users are and trying to understand their behaviors as well. And so though we're not necessarily like looking at the social media particularly, that is something that could be a resource as well. Like the way that they're using our particular platform is mainly what we're looking at and that's where we're getting our data. Um, but the different skills or resources that you can get from this can then help to understand the way that I work now at Victor Chart as well. <laughs> no questions? Should we start? Okay, I, I can ask questions, I think. I'm your boss at the end. I can ask as many questions as I want, right? Okay. Uh, so, so I worked with Twitter at some point in my life, I'm much older. Um, so one of the questions is, is true for every statistical analysis you do. In fact, it's how representative. Okay, you have you have your hypothesis, right? Your, your question. So, for example, uh, can you predict what's going to be the uh, the next president of the United States, right? So you are running. You, you have different possibilities to get. And so you can run surveys, you can use your social media and so on. And uh, the statistician in this uh, in this house know that uh, there are problems for going from a small sample to a population, right? So any hints on how Twitter is representative? Because like if you take a look at, at the media, like Twitter is always like the, the bad guy, like nobody's using it, or like weird guys like techies and so on, like the rest of the population don't care and they use Facebook. So how is Twitter really representative of the population if you have uh, like a social science question in mind? Yeah, so um, for the hypothesis that I had, it was representative because in, I did a lot of research on kind of the communication methods that the different social media platforms offer. So if you're a part of Facebook, it's kind of more intimate personal connections and you post more long form. And then if you're at Instagram, you're like posting, oh, it can be more public, but you're posting more visually. And Twitter, it's typically the people who are more politically involved or they're wanting to get information on something newsworthy or business-minded or politically involved. And it's fast information quick because it was at that time 140 characters and now it's increased, I don't know how many it is now. But the because of so there is a potential bias because of the people who are using it are typically already in this mindset but it's representative for the what i was researching because these are the people who are going to be posting about the politically active or politically driven movements um, and so you have to definitely understand like which ones you're looking at and that they all have offered different modes but um, overall, I would say that it depends on the question that you're asking whether it's representative or not, um, but uh, it definitely does get people from a very diverse background within the U.S., so um, it's like decent amount. <laughs> the last question? No? Uh, that's, that's it? Someone's finished. No? Okay, I have the last question and I will make the last comment. Uh, like, do, do you know for the Pure Research Center, for example, when uh, the, the table that you presented, there were like a very specific categories uh, that they used? Uh, do you have any idea on how they managed to map? You see, like, the, like how did they manage to, to map all these different categories into the analysis that they made? Yeah, yeah. Like, were they like they were scrapping the stuff manually, or how did you? Yeah. So, 
at least with Pew, they were, yeah, they were getting all of the information when they used these particular hashtags, so Black Lives Matter, BLM, All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, um, and then the text that was included among those hashtags, so whatever they said before or after the hashtag, then they would get the commonalities between these, and they would then categorize based on the types of words used, so it was like either fatal police encounter, violent acts, police law enforcement, etc. And so it was definitely a, a mix of automation and manual because they could see the commonalities between, but then they had to group them together themselves to determine that these were the six that they wanted to measure against. Okay, thank you. <laughs> More question, I guess. Okay. Uh, I have, in fact, one last comment on, on that, uh, referring to your question about correlation, right? Uh, so, in, in many cases, uh, social media analysis is, in fact, used as a proxy for something else because it's, you can get the data easily.